All right, so this is our video for Chapter 14, and we're going to do most of the topics in Chapter 14. We're going to focus on sound, waves, the speed of sound, sound intensity, um, sound phenomena, and a little bit of the Doppler effect. And we're going to skip the musical instruments and sound characteristics just because it doesn't really impact life sciences or engineering technology. Um, might be of interest to education but students but we're we're skipping it just the same so a little bit of an introduction to our um waves is that it's actually related to pressure waves when we're talking about solids liquids and gases so hopefully this will open up into my very cool um, simulation here. So if we come here, we can look at we, a wave simulator. So this is the wave acting like sound, right? <clears throat> And we can, right, we can, let's see, there's, yeah, so I can change some things, right, so I can change my frequency. Now it looks a little bit more like an oscilloscope, and we can see the dots, right, they're just showing us how things are changing. I could change the wave speed, right? And if I do that, right, <clears throat> we can see how, again, it changes. I can change the amplitude, right, and then, right, amplitude, whoops, here is very much like amplitude in our previous sections, right, how high it is above the x-axis, right? smaller one centimeter, double it, right, so we can see these kinds of relationships right <clears throat> we can do it in slow motion if we want to Just, right? but we get the general idea then of what impacts our motion of our sound waves <clears throat> right and so if we struck a tuning fork right we would have these waves of sound and they would eventually get to our ear Right, and these are really pressure fluctuations within the air, right? So air is basically a gas, right, opposed to a solid or a liquid. So these pressure waves hit the eardrum, and they literally get converted to nerve impulses, which are like a little electric signals. And our brains magically interpret this as sound, and we can, right, discern different pitches, right, different which is basically different frequencies, right? <clears throat> and these are just parts of the ear, which I won't go into because I am so not a biologist. So when we think about hearing, there's actually a frequency range, very much like there is a frequency range for light, which is just another kind of wave that can travel through air and solids and liquids so ultrasonic waves are too high in frequency for human ears right so there is a limit to what we can actually hear and it's between right 20 Hertz and 20 kilohertz and above that dogs cats bats they might be able to hear it but they have right a different ear construction basically and they can hear a different range of frequencies Right. Infrasonic waves have frequencies too low for human ears, so that's below 20 hertz, and they are produced by earthquakes and other natural phenomena. Elephants, cows, horses, right, they can actually hear and sense those frequencies, but the human ear cannot, right? So we can only, right, our brains and our eardrums can own and hammer and all of those pieces and parts, right, can only really hear in the audible range. As we get older, right, 
the upper frequency becomes harder and harder for us to hear, right? And right when we lose some of our hearing abilities, usually it's the higher frequencies that go actually first. So say that we have an annoying sound in our ear, right? So our ear picks up this sound and it is actually a mosquito buzzing around female mosquitoes because they're the ones who make the annoying sound right <clears throat> and their its wings are beating at 600 times per second and so the first thing we want to calculate is the frequency of our sound waves right and so frequency is the number of cycles per second oh well we are given that in this problem right 600 right cycles or right beats per second and so cycle per second is just a hertz so we could write that as 600 hertz right or one over seconds what's the wavelength of the speed of if the speed of sound is 340 meters per second which is the speed of sound in air right much slower than the speed of light, which is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, right? This is why, right, we might see the flash of lightning and then we hear, right, the sound of thunder and, right, you can count the, diff the seconds in between and figure out how far away the thunderstorm is. But here we have our velocity, we have our frequency, and we wanna know the wavelength, right, oops, of our sound and by the way this is the same equation that we use in light so we take physics for life sciences too right when we get to talking about light and electromagnetic spectrum we use this exact same equation so this means that if I take my velocity and divide it by my frequency I will get my wavelength and my wavelength is going to be in meters here. So I have 340 meters per second divided by my frequency, 600, and we're just going to call it one over seconds. So we can see that one over seconds and one over seconds, right, cancel. So I'm going to end up with wavelength in meters take out my handy dandy calculator and we have 340 meters divided by 600 and that gives us 0.567 basically so 0 0.567 meters so our wavelength is literally in meters so if we thought about it right as this is my length right and this is the amplitude right or the intensity then this whole cycle which I didn't draw very symmetrically from here to here could be a length of 0.567 meters <clears throat> ultrasound is based on partially on the same idea but also on the idea that sound hits a wall and bounces off and so bats use this for echolocation so they can figure out where right flying insects are also helps them not run into the wall um, and so right this is the same kind of idea right this is also the idea behind our motion sensors in lab which uses pretty much the same idea right it sends out a, a signal, it happens to be a light signal, that reflects off of the surface of, say, our cart, right, and then bounces back, and it, it measures the time between, right, and the length, right, the distance between the motion detector and the cart, and that, along with some nice programming, allows us to look at position versus time, velocity versus time, and acceleration versus time looking way back to the beginning, right, of the semester in our first face-to-face -face lab. This is also the same idea of ultrasound, like, say, your sister's having a baby, right, and they want to look at, right, 
count uh, make sure that there are 10 fingers and 10 toes see if it's a boy or a girl this uses exactly the same idea where we have actually sound waves that go into the person and then reflect off and that helps us do medical imaging right for both diagnostics and treatment right and again lots of very fancy software for that visualization that comes up but it's based on this idea of ultrasound and reflected sound waves so if we look at the speed of sound we can look at what that speed looks like in different materials so if we look at solids we can see right here whoops we can see here in our there it is in our solids right this is the largest right so it's the fastest we'll call it fastest so but it's for sound it's fastest it's not faster for things like light that get reflected off of say an aluminum surface so <clears throat> and then in liquids fast but not quite as fast and then here in air here is our standard right there it is there is our more or less standard um, speed in air if the air is zero degrees C right in our previous problem right back here we use 340 meters per second that's because that's the speed of sound in air when the air is 20 degrees C or room temperature <clears throat> and then weird things happen when we have have hydrogen but we're not going to delve into that so the speed of sound in a solid is given by the square root of the Young's modulus so you remember that from chapter 9 divided by the density right and that gives us the speed of sound in our solid right? if we're talking about a liquid then we don't have a Young's modulus right instead we have a bulk modulus so it's the resistance to compression that we look at and still we look at the density of the liquid so that has a lot to do with right why we see these different speeds in these different materials alcohol versus mercury for instance versus water right it has to do with bulk modulus which is a characteristic of the material right and also the cross-sectional area right so we very much like Young's modulus right so say speaking of thunder and lightning say that thunder from a lightning flash is heard by an observer three seconds after she sees the flash we want to know what is the approximate distance to the lightning strike in kilometers and then in miles so first of all the velocity of light right is much greater than the velocity of sound in air so the velocity of light right in air or vacuum we usually write it as the letter C I have no idea why so 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second and then our sound right so the velocity of sound will take the value 340 meters per second right so that's what it is if right it's somewhere around room temperature 68 degrees C <clears throat> so it's 3 seconds difference right and so our distance right so our speeds are both constant we're not worrying about different air pressures or anything fancy like that so if we think back to chapter 2 right the distance is equal to right our speed times time right or our velocity times time if we're talking about displacement <clears throat> so in reality right the time that it takes the light from the lightning to get to our eyes is almost instantaneous so the only thing we have to worry about really is this a lot much slower velocity of sound in our air so and I want to know how far apart it is so I'll just use I'll call this the, the speed it doesn't really matter so my distance is going to be my speed 
340 meters per second times my time, which is 3 seconds. And if I had more coffee, right, I might be able to do that in my head, but not today. And that gives us 1,020 meters. So 1,020 meters. They wanted us in part A to find that in kilometers. So we can just divide by 1,000 so that 1.020 kilometers. If I want to convert 1,020 meters into miles, right, there's 1,609 1, meters in one mile. And so that's a pretty easy conversion. All right, so I'm going to take my answer and divide by 1,609. And so it's about 0.634 miles away. So a little over a half a mile. Again, right, the, if we look, right, our light, right, is, so we could write this as 3.40 times 10 to the 2 meters per second. So literally our light is 10 to the 6th times faster than our sound. So we don't, it's pretty much instantaneous, right? So we don't have to worry about that at all. <clears throat> so again, flashing back to chapter 9 and our Young's modulus, right? So that had to do with force per cross-sectional area, F over A, right? As well as, right, our change in length over the original length, and that's how we can calculate Young's modulus. If we think about bulk modulus, so this is if we are looking at solids, not in terms of length, but in terms of volume, right? And we can compress it or expand it, but usually compressing, as we see in our two pictures here, right? <clears throat> so we have forces that actually make it smaller, and it's not going to necessarily be a lot smaller, <coughs> but we have delta V, right, the change in volume over, right, the initial volume. And so our bulk modulus is very similar to our calculation for Young's modulus, right, the ratio of change in length over original length has no units, and our bulk modulus, we have Right, the change in volume over the initial volume also has no units. Because we're usually talking about fluids when we talk about bulk modulus, right, the force per unit area is actually the pressure. And so in this case, it's going to be the change in pressure. So I can find the change in pressure right, relative to the change in volume divided by the original volume, and that will give me my bulk modulus. Finally, as I already alluded to, right, the speed of sound is temperature dependent. And it's a pretty simple equation. You notice that we have T and it has a C, right? This just means that, right, it must be, whoops, must be in Celsius. So our temperature has to be in Celsius. Right, in order to give us our speed. Here, there you don't see units in here, but right, it's a velocity, and this 331, right, that's the speed if the temperature equals zero degrees C. So our temperature in Celsius could be positive, increasing our velocity in air, right? or it could actually be smaller because my temperature in Celsius could be a negative value. Right? But it doesn't work if we use Fahrenheit, so very important to note. So here we have a, an equation, and we are just told that the speed of sound in air on a summer day is 350 degrees C, and we want to know the air temperature. So... <clears throat> Oh, the speed of sound. Oh, that's wrong. It should be... <laughs> that's what happens when you use copy things, and, and, and I 
put the units in wrong. Meters per second. The velocity of air is going to be 350 meters per second. We want to know what is the air temperature, right? So that means that my 350 meters per second is V. And if I subtract 331 meters per second from that, I will get 0.6 times the temperature in Celsius. So let's see. So that's 19 meters per second. If I divide that by 0.6, that's going to give me my air temperature. So I have 19 meters per second divided by 0.6. Through the miracle, right, we can see that 0.6 must have units in order to give us, right, 0.6 times the temperature, right, gives us a velocity. So here we just, it's one of those equations that should have units, but somehow we don't write it with units, you know, the kind of thing that drives me crazy. So we divide 19 by 0.6, and we get 32 degrees C. So that must be the air temperature, which is pretty warm, because I'll remind you that 20 degrees C is about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a pretty warm day. Right. And notice again that right, my air temperature is enabling my velocity for my sound to be larger. So here <clears throat> we have another problem. So the speed of sound in steel is about 4,500 meters per second. A steel rail, right, like for a train is struck with a hammer and an observer that happens to be 0.4 kilometers away has one ear to the rail. How much time will elapse from the time the sound is heard from the rail until the time it is heard through the air? And we'll assume that the air temperature is 20 degrees C and there's no wind blowing. So that means that, right, my, since it's 20 degrees C, Right, my velocity of my sound is 340 meters per second. I could verify that right by doing this calculation and having right 0 0.6 times 20 degrees C. You can kind of partially do that in your head, right? So <clears throat> that's what it is in air. And then my velocity for my substance, my solid, right? So in this case, steel is 4,500 meters per second, much faster. Because it travels much faster in solid than it does in air. <clears throat> and we know the distance. The distance is 0 0.400 kilometers. But I'm going to put that in meters since both of my velocities are in meters per second. So that's 400 meters. And I want to know, right, how much time will elapse. The time that elapses is in this equation right here. It's just delta t. So the time that elapses is the difference between the time that it takes my sound to travel in air, so, and travel 400 meters, right, divided by 340 seconds. So that's going to be the time that it takes to travel in air, right, and then minus the time that it takes for the sound to travel through my solid, which happens to be steel. air, right, time versus solid time, right, air because it's going to go slower in the air, so that time's going to be larger. So I have 400 meters divided by 340 meters per second gives me 1.1 1 .1 
0.176 seconds. And then minus 400 meters divided by 4,500 meters per second gives me mm. 0 0.089 seconds. And so now I can figure out the difference in hearing my sound. So 1.176 seconds minus 0 0.089 seconds gives me 1.087 seconds. Again, right, the velocity of sound in a solid is faster than it is in a gas like air. We can also talk about sound intensity, right, and loudness. <clears throat> so here is just kind of a neat little diagram that actually is from the textbook um, where we can have something that's very loud, like a jackhammer. It's 120 decibels, and, right, that might hurt your ear, right? 110 for a rock band with amplifiers, so you go to see ACDC, right? Don't don't sit right in front of the speakers. You'll you'll be hearing those hell's bells forever in your head. Um, and then we could go down to city traffic, seven seventy decibels. An average home, a normal conversation, right? Sixty and fifty. A quiet library, forty. A soft whisper, twenty decibels. So we can see right this range, and then zero, right? There could be a sound, but we can't actually hear it because it's not within our range. So we perceive sound, right, with a pitch, right, high pitch, low pitch, which is connected to frequency, but also loudness. And when we talk about loudness, <clears throat> we talk about it in decibels, but we can also talk about it here. We see it in watts per square meter. Right, so that's what the W is. It's basically power, right, per square meter cross-sectional area. So a minimum detectable sound has an intensity of about one times ten to the minus twelfth watts per cubic, or sorry, square meter, and it actually hurts our ear if we get up to about one watt per square meter. <clears throat> We talk about things in decibels because, right, decibels are actually based on a logarithmic scale, right? And so we have to go back and remember a little bit of math that if x is equal to 10 raised to the y, then I can write this mathematically as y is equal to the base 10 log of x. So things to remember about Logarithms, because they can combine in ways that are not like regular numbers because they're basically base 10. So the log of AB is equal to the log of A plus the log of B. The log of A divided by B is the same as the log of A minus the log of B. Numbers with large ranges have logarithms that cover a small range. In other words, the scale is compressed. It's not linear. Right? Sometimes we, you may have graphed things on log paper or with a log scale because they weren't linear unless we looked at it in base 10. Right? And we can have numerical steps that have equal ratios, right? but have logarithms that differ by equal amounts. So when we talk about intensity, right? we talk about I as our intensity opposed to I for current, which we do in circuits, right? And so I0 is basically that minimum level. So if we go back a few slides, right, our minimum detectable level is about 1 times 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. And so that's where this value comes from. And so we can talk about, right, <clears throat> 10 log and the ratio of our intensities relative to basically the minimum we can hear, right? So rules for decibels as far as hearing, the average listener 
a sound will be perceived as roughly twice as loud when its intensity is increased by a factor of 10 because we're looking at logarithms, base 10 logs. Doubling a sound's intensity raises the sound intensity level, which is beta, by three decibels. So again, right, there's not that linear linearity between our variables because again, it's base 10 log, right? And an increase in the sound intensity level of one decibel is the just noticeable difference in loudness for the average listener. Just noticeable, right, difference, right? So we're talking about this again. This is pretty much the low end of the scale for most people. So here's just a table of, that's a little bit like what we saw in our nice little graphic, which is more interesting, right? And that, But then it adds in, right, when we can have damage to our ears. So my my paternal grandfather worked at a, he was a crane operator and it was a long time ago, it was before they wore ear protection and he was deaf as a post, right? Because he heard very loud sounds at work, right? Pretty much every, every day. So we can damage our ears by having, right? intense sound levels, especially over time. So <clears throat> what is the intensity level in decibels of a 23 decibel sound after being amplified by 10,000, right? Well, remember that we have our, our, um, intensity, right, is beta, so our intensity level is equal to 10 log, and then the ratio of our two intensities. So here, right, <clears throat> our intensity is amplified by 10,000. That's why we have here this ratio of, oops, there we go, no, there we are, right, where we have our ratio Right, this is 10,000, oh, this should be 10,000 times I0, oops, we, no, it doesn't like me today, there we go, right, so it's, it's amplified by 10,000, so that just means that I have the log, right, of 10,000, equals 23. Oh, well, wait a minute, though. Is that right? Let's see. Well, not really. Oh, no, I guess it's, it's just, this is still just I. Just didn't read it right. Right, so here we can look at it in terms of, right, our log of I over I naught. So remember, if we go back to our rules for logs, right, here is the log of A divided by B is the same as the log of A minus the log of B. <clears throat> so we have log of I over I zero. Right, which happens to be 10,000, right? That would be the same as the log of I plus the log of I initial. And we know what that I initial value is. We can look that up, right? So now we have to kind of go from there. We know that this is going to be equal to 23 decibels. So we have... 23 decibels is equal to 10, right? And then the log of I, which is 10,000, I, right? Minus, oops, that should be a minus. 
minus the log of i0. So I can figure out what this is. Right? And then I'm going to break this up like, like we did here. So here I can go in and been a while. Oh, there's the log. So I'm going to look for the log, right, of my minimum. So that's 1 times 10 to the minus 12. And that is equal to 12. So this is 12. And now I can take this value and break it up in this way. So I have the log of 10,000 plus the log of i. So I can look up, and this is all going to end up equaling 23 decimals. So now I can find the log of 10,000, log 10,000. I have enough zeros, and that's 4. So now I have 10, right, times 4 plus the log of i minus 12. And that's going to be equal to 23 decibels. And so now I can do some math. So hold on a minute. I'm going to pause for a second because I have to sneeze. All right. Sorry about that. But, you know, maybe it's my COVID shot. Anyway, oh, now I thought oh, there it is. I, was, I suddenly lost my pen. All right. So now I can divide 23 by 10. So that gives me 2.3. Three, right, and then minus four plus twelve, right, is going to be equal to the log of my intensity. So I can figure out what this is. So I have two point three minus four plus twelve, and that equals ten point three. So I have, oops, so this equals. 10.3. So now I'm going to take the inverse log, right, so I can figure out what i is. Did this right, then this would be one would be two point oh, and that would be in watts per square meter. Hope I did that right. It's been a long time. All right, <clears throat> sound phenomenon. Right, we have reflection, the bouncing of sound waves off of a surface. We talked about that when we talked about ultrasound, right? We can have refraction, which is the bending of sound waves as they pass through varying mediums, and we have a very cool uh, simulation for that. And then we have diffraction, so that is when the bending of sound waves goes around an obstacle or an, through an opening. So let's see if oh, this is going to be. 
is actually bending light, but we'll have the same idea. So this happens to be light, but you'll get the general idea. So this is reflected light, and then this is refracted light, which just means that it can enter a medium. Right? And we can see that there is a relationship, which we will talk about in um, Physics for Life Sciences 2. Right? We can see that when our light enters here, right, it changes. Right? And so we actually have a smaller angle of refraction than we had for our angle of reflection. And this is, again, the same basic idea um, when we talk about bending light opposed to bending our sound waves, but at least gives you an idea of what refraction looks like. And so here is an example of sound refracting when the density of air changes and so we can see right our sound right bending in a different way so we might hear right him saying something but here it's cooler air and then up here right we see our sound waves bending differently Right, because above our little lake here, right, the air is much warmer. This is the same idea as a Doppler effect. So we have a car or a train horn approaches you or moves away, right, and right, we can hear a change in the pitch, right, when the sound first rises and then falls, and this is called the Doppler effect. And hopefully my simulation thing will work. So here we have right observer in front of a source. Here's high pitched, a higher pitch, shorter wavelength sound compared to our observer over here. Right, and I can't tell what these little things are supposed to be. That's my thing. It's gonna. I'm gonna get the spinny spinny. Oh, there we go. So here is an equation for the Doppler effect, right? Plus or minus depends on whether or not the person is moving away or toward the sound, the source of the sound, right? So stationary sound source looks like this, right? Moving sound source looks not as symmetric, so we can see a change in how it is essentially kind of bent here. This is the velocity of sound relative to the speed of light, right? So, and they are explaining that it's, right, 0.7, right, Mach. And then here, right, we have the source moving at C. Oh, sorry, C is not that C. And so we can see again how it is distorted, right? Here we have it, right? Larger than our C value. And we can see again how, right, the shape of our sound waves changes, right, with time, right? And so these are the kinds of things that we can change, right? depending on how we're moving again right this is our relationship right relative the frequencies relative to the speeds gotta pick the right thing there we go so here is another way of writing that same equation right so we have motion of an approaching sound source causes the wavelength as received by a stationary observer to be shorter when the source is approaching, resulting in a higher oh, frequency. It got cut off. Um, <clears throat> I think my picture of my equation is over it. So here, <clears throat> right, here is our car, for instance, moving towards our stationary observer, right? 
and we can see here how right, our frequency changes. And right, this is our two velocities. Here we have a more general, right? So the effect when the source is receding, right, is the same except for the sign of its velocity. So if we combine these two things, right, then moving away or receding, right, that means that these are positive. And if, right, the source is approaching, we're going towards, then we use these negative signs in this equation. So it's just right, a general equation where we just need to know if the source is moving away or moving toward so we know what the right sign is for our equation. <clears throat> we can also do the same thing if the source is stationary and the observer is who's moving. So now, right, if the observer is approaching, then that is positive sign and if the observer is receding or walking away then that's a negative so we can see that these two equations are similar yet different so we have to be careful so again this is the one if it's the source that's moving the source of the sound right and here if the observer is moving so just a case of picking the right equation and then worrying about our signs. So here we have, right, we want to know the frequency heard by a person who is driving 60 kilometers per hour toward a factory whistle, right? So it's our, our observer who is moving towards a stationary sound, right? The factory is not moving. So our observer is moving so we use this equation, right? And then we have to worry about our signage, right? So our, we want to know, is our observer approaching or driving away? Nope, he's, he's heading toward our factory whistle, right? And so it's approaching, so we're going to use our positive, right? So we're going to use the positive, right? sign here, right? So we're going to add our two velocities. So we have our person driving, right? <clears throat> and we'll come over here where we look at, right? O is the observer, right here, right? S is the source. So S is the source. O is the observer. So, whoops. so our observer is moving. Right, so we have the frequency of the source, and we're going to figure out then, right, what our frequency by the observer is going to be. Right, so our, so we have the frequency of our observer, which is what we're looking for. Right, so we have V of the observer, and then V, this V here is of our velocity in air, right? And we're at zero degrees C, so that means that we have 331. So we have 331 meters per second, right? And our observer is driving 60 kilometers per hour. We're going to have to change that into meters per second. So we have 60 kilometers per hour. And so one kilometer has 1,000 meters. And one hour has 3,000 seconds. So we can do our conversion. So oops, six, 60 kilometers per hour times 10,000, or sorry, 1,000 meters per kilometer, and then divided by 3,600 seconds per hour, and that gives us, right, ooh, wow, oh, oh, that's because I missed, and I was going to say, boy, that's really large, 60 times 1,000, I punched numbers in wrong, right, divided by 3,060, oh, that's better. 
So that's about 16.7 meters per second. So we have 331 meters per second plus, we'll call it 17 meters per second, divided by V, the velocity of our sound. And then all times the frequency of our source, which is 800 hertz. So we have 331 plus 17. And then divided by 331 gives us 1.05. So it's going to be about 5% greater, right, than the actual whistle's frequency. And so the frequency that our observer hears is going to be 841 hertz. Here's just a much simpler graphic that's just a graphic. It's not a simulation like our little website earlier. So if an object is moving faster than the speed of sound, it will outpace its sound waves, creating what they call a sonic boom, right? And then a similar phenomenon produces the wake from a boat, right? It's going faster than the wave speed in the water. But here we can see, right, that difference between the velocity of sound and the velocity of the object. Oh, that's what it is in C. It's such a weird thing to use on our simulation. And that is the end of our video on sound.